موسیقی I'm very lucky that I've been joined by my very well-learned colleague who happens to be Ms. Hajar Sati. I happen to be Shazad Asan Khan and we hope and pray that everybody out there is doing wonderfully well and that you're ready to kickstart your day with us. But first things first, hello Hajar, Assalamu Alaikum, how are you feeling today? Wa Alaikum Assalam, thank you so much Jazakallah Khair for introducing me. It's a bit chilly I would say for the studio because we have the ACs on but Alhamdulillah we are witnessing a fine transition uh, from I think autumn to winter or is it too soon to say that but uh, the fall in uh, Islamabad is really really amazing and uh, today happens to be 22nd of October and we have some very interesting uh, news lined up so in a recent development the renowned Pakistani martial artist Irfan oh Mehsood has added another feather to his cap by breaking the Guinness World Record for longest time in the reverse plank position carrying a weight of 80 pounds oh wow, wow. Irfan surpassed India's Manish Sharma's record of 2 minutes and 6 seconds, achieving the feat in 2 minutes and 28 seconds. Irfan has established himself as a Guinness World Record holder in various categories, including push-ups, most jumping jacks, most squats, most fitness and martial art record. Irfan has broken the record from 17 countries, including US, Great Britain, China, Spain, Philippines, Norway and India. He has become the first Pakistani martial artist to achieve the 100 Guinness World Record in an impressive span of 40 years. Um, his current tally stands at 120 World Records. Exactly. Record. And, and what I don't get is, you know, because just yesterday, you know, we actually mentioned this yeah. uh, Guinness World Record of walking 38 dogs, you know, so, yeah. you know, doing in plank Canada, in reverse. Yeah. So, we are not talking about the efficacy <laughs> of it, but we're talking about how, you know, we have won right. a record. But in addition to this, we won a gold medal as well, Haja. Wonderful. You know, so Pakistani bodybuilder Ramiz Ibrahim Khan won gold medal in Mr. Universe competition in Las Vegas. Ramiz Khan won gold medal for Pakistan in men's physique category. He also backed the title of professional athlete with pro card. Bodybuilders from 44 countries participated in the event. Wow. Oh, congratulations. And I think that's a very wonderful feat. And uh, we are constantly focusing on the sports and that too, uh, physical sports or mind sports. So I think uh, all of the things are flowing in that flow, like the sporty flow. Alhamdulillah. But uh, like I mentioned, it uh, is 22nd of October and it happens to be the International Stuttering Awareness Day which is right around the corner and we are observing it today. Um, there are several ways how we can raise awareness uh, regarding a little or a no cause. So we hope that um, uh, you know we are spreading the awareness regarding the stammering or stuttering. So there are some very interesting fun facts about it. It is a disruption in a speech pattern involving disruptions or disfluencies in a person's speech. But there are nearly as many ways to stutter as there are people who stutter. Uh, there are lots of myths regarding stuttering but including the notion that it can be cured whether you are a person who stutters the family member or a friend just or just someone who has a special interest in stuttering we are here to uh, obviously we, we will get you more Support, information yeah. regarding that um, and obviously it is a very interesting uh, sort of a day and I think with the speech therapy, you can overcome this uh, condition that you call stammering or stuttering. Exactly. And in addition to this, I think, you know, let's come down to what we will be talking about. So, you know, there are a lot of fields, ladies and gentlemen, where obviously when there is intervention, they can certainly do better. Unfortunately, for Pakistan, for the last couple of years, we weren't really doing well in terms of economy. There are a lot of indicators right. of it. We have an expert to kind of speak about it. And just a few days ago, right on the program, I said that it looks like and it feels like as if that the economy of Pakistan is actually moving towards more stable position and to kind of discuss that why not you know right early in the morning if you have a reassurance that your country is doing wonderfully well I think it's a good news to kind of speak about it we're very lucky that we've actually been joined by somebody who happens to be the former ambassador to WTO he is Dr. Manzoor Ahmed Saab hello sir assalamu alaikum good morning how are you Okay, good morning and bonjour. Since you used many languages, <laughs> I can say Pharale, I can use some languages. Right, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. And that really shows that you have the diplomatic acumen and you have traveled <laughs> wide and far. So, Dr. Manzoor, since your expertise lies in the international trade, you have been the ambassador to the World Trade Organization. Yes. So, let's start uh, with the international development. So, there are a lot of conversation regarding the de dollarization that is taking place, right? So, China and Russia, they had the agreements where they will swap the currency in the local currency. Right. 
what does this mean for uh, uh, i mean a liberal order economic liberal order which is dominated by the dollar and how does pakistan get into that equation you see first there may be a lot of speculation because it makes good news <laughs> but overall 80% of uh, world's uh, reserves yeah, yeah, yeah. plus uh, okay, um, trading currency. So is dollar is there to rule, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there isn't really, uh, I mean, the world is looking because uh, U.S. put so many sanctions and stopped uh, Russia, uh, Iran, and, and, and some other countries. Yeah. You can't use dollar. So they are looking, but there's mm. no real alternative. At one time, the, this euro was emerging. But right. then it really fizzled out. Now, the maybe the next be best currency is uh, the Chinese renminbi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if you look at it, I mean, in, in terms of international reserves or anything, mm -hmm. uh, it's nowhere. I mean, it's it's maybe two three percent share compared right. to where where U.S. dollar is eighty percent share. So it's it's not really. And and at one time also the Japanese uh, yen was, but then Japanese uh, economies. Uh, struggled for the so last three, three decades. So, it's a so Dr. Manzo, so now let's come back to Pakistan's, Pakistan's yeah. economy. We are witnessing yeah. that yeah. Uh, inflation has um, risen down, right? And there are lots of conversations regarding that. What, number one, what are the implications? And secondly, I would also like you to touch on the macroeconomic stability. And when we talk about the macroeconomic stability, reforming the institutional structures, they are very essential to the essence of that. How do we go about that? Uh, you see, we had a very low base. I mean, f f for the last five, six years, the, the big talk was when we, when, when does this country default? I mean, you know, we were always on the verge. Will we able to meet our bills? Will we able to pay for our, our imports, etc.? Mm -hmm. And I think that has now died down. At least there's some stability. Okay, okay. And you know, we were almost in recession uh, last year as well. Right. So this year there's about two percent, and next year is also expected to go about two point five percent growth. Mm -hmm. But if you look at various other indicators. Mm -hmm. Like say, mm, uh, 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 well, I mean, look at stock exchange. Yes. This year, it in dollar terms. I'm not talking Pakistan rupee. Yep. Dollar terms, if you had put in some money, it is more than 100 percent <coughs> increased. Wow. See, 100 percent. This was the best performing stock market in the world. Okay. okay. So that that's one thing. Second, big. Uh, you you just spoke about inflation. Yeah. Really, inflation was terrible, especially for very poor people, True. because they just about make their living. And if they if they uh, uh, inflation is in triple, uh, I mean, 30, 40, 50 percent, then it's uh, really really hurts them. So it was. If you look at May 2023, it was something like 38 percent. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, it's in single digits. Seven, eight percent, maybe it's come down to seven percent. Mm -hmm. So, so that's another uh, big indicator. Which is yes, why, sir, in addition to this, you know, let's let's come because you know, for everybody who's out there, we go out in 47 yeah. different countries and to understand economy, obviously, it's going to be a difficult yes, subject okay. early in the morning. Okay. But there are a few factors which actually kind of constitute of your economy, may it be growth and investment, agriculture, fiscal development, money, credit, capital markets, inflation, yeah, yeah. yeah. trade and payment, public debt, education, health, nutrition, energy, yeah, yeah. transport. And you know, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. what I'm going to do is I'm going to share from growth and investment, GDP 2.38% positive, agriculture 6.25% positive, industries 1.21%. Per capita income has gone to $1,680. Investment has gone 13.1% as the percentage of GDP with agriculture 6.25%, crops 11.03%, livestock, you know. So everything's going up. Uh, there was only one arrow which I noticed which was going down. But before we actually kind of move further, what did we do wrong in the last four, five, six years, which we are doing right now that, you know, that we see that we are streamlining everything? I, I, I think one is an international uh, uh, factor yeah. that we highly depend on import of oil. You know, almost 30% oh, yes. of our imports is oil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if, if the oil per barrel crude was more than $100, and now it's come down to $70, so that's a big, big, that, that gives us a True. big relief. True. And with oil, uh, you know, after that um, Ukraine-Russian war t two years ago, uh, prices of commodities, at, at the time oh. our crops were, I mean, we needed wheat and we needed uh, everything almost, uh, cotton and everything. And then uh, last year we had bumper crops. Huh? We had uh, excess wheat because we had imported some we, because we were anticipating yeah. shortage and then we had access we didn't know what to do with that yeah. mm -hmm. and then uh, um, rice 
yeah. rice. I mean, normally we, ex oh, okay, we have been exporting, but maybe between one to two billion dollars. And last year, it exceeded more than three billion dollars. Yeah, it was at 3.8 billion dollars. 3.8 billion dollars. In fact, our agriculture export almost doubled from about four billion to eight billion. True, true. So that was a bi bi big plus. Exactly. Because yeah. in addition to this, sir, because I was there, you know, when we were celebrating, so the REAP guys, you know, yeah. and the Trade okay. Asso Development Association of Pakistan, okay. they came to uh, up front and said, hey, you know what, we need to celebrate. It was around four billion dollars. And the Premier said, you know, I'm not really happy with that. You know, we need to bring up to eight billion dollars or 12 billion dollars. Number one, I think we do need such visionaries. Number two, when we sp uh, speak about IT exports, we have reached a milestone of $4 billion, which is nothing in terms of IT exports. Now, while we are at it, we are speaking about it, we are celebrating. How do you think that we really need to kind of capitalize on the vision that our premier actually kind of keeps on sharing with us that, hey, you know what, we need to do this, do that. And we finally see our economy as an engine which is now have which actually allows combustion which actually allows uh, propulsion which is why we see our economy growing yes you know propulsion or engine of growth it comes from international trade you know you look at any country in the last 30 years that really took off was through international trade True. and unfortunately pakistan's trade has been stagnant for the last many many years uh, i mean at least uh, from 2008 we have been uh, if, if you look at the countries around India, Bangladesh, even Afghanistan, mm -hmm. at least two to three hundred percent up. Pakistan trade actually in dollar term maybe one or a little bit, but percentage terms, it, uh, we, we lost our market share. Maybe it was uh, zero point one six, but it was also very low. Mm -hmm. But we lost it. It has come down to zero point one two. Yeah. One of the things is that you know we have uh, really um, put solid walls around us, uh, tariff walls. I'm talking about even even actually other walls. You look at all our borders, we have put this barbed wire, etc. And we are, we are not part of any any effective trade agreement. Land route trades, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. We don't trade with our next door neighbors here, we, in any of uh, our neighbors. So we are, we are, our trade and trade performance has been very poor. That That is one thing. The other big thing we have, have is we have had these state operated enterprises. So we're losing huge amounts. Just last year, they lost something like 900 billion rupees. So the, the losses are huge. But we have been staggering. We have been putting what, what, what you call uh, kicking the cane down the road. And, uh, you know, this PIA, every single day, they lose something like 500 million something. And, and then we, we, we just, we've been thinking, we've been, now, next door India, what, you know, they also realize their Air India is not uh, doing well. Yeah. So they just sold it off. Even I, you know, I spent many, many years in Switzerland, and they had a very good airline, uh, Swiss Air, I think. But one or two years, they lost money. They, s they just <laughs> bankrupted it, sold it to the but, uh, but Germans. Do Dr. Manzu, we are operating in an environment where uh, internationally you will feel and you will find that um, the nationalistic policies are extremely on the rise, right? So uh, countries are protecting their trade in the form of the tariffs, like you mentioned, yes. right? Yes. So this is a major disruption to the free flow of the trade, right? Yes. Now, in this international environment, how does Pakistan... Uh, improve its trade flow and especially with the countries, you know, which is, um, you know, how can we give the most favored nation status to other nations out there? Yeah, that's a, that's a you know, government decision. <laughs> I mean, you know, they Go have there. to be bold and take that decision. But the other thing is, you know, they, uh, okay, at one time they created this, what they call South Asia Free Trade Agreement, yeah. hoping that this will, you know, allow this thing. But, but then, uh, because on the, uh, between in SEFTA countries, mm -hmm. for example, India and Bangladesh, mm -hmm. They moved on, and their trade at the time was 2.5 billion. It right. moved to 17 billion, six okay. times jump. Okay. And our trade was maybe 3 billion. It come down to 1 billion. Right. That, that, that's, I'm talking SEFTA. But more recently, all Asian Pacific countries got into what they call Regional Cooperation for Economic Partnership, RCEP, led by China. Okay. And all oh countries yeah. from Japan, South Korea, and all ASEAN, 16 countries, they're part of it. Pakistan is not looking there because Pakistan has been fixated right from the beginning to only export to Western countries, US and EU. And those economies are not really growing. True. The growing part is this, uh, this East part. Asia, but yeah. we are not looking there. And there are a lot of policies within the governments. They are looking to Asia, right? And they specifically look to Asia policies. But sir, one last question before we wind up this segment. Do you think that we can uh, hope to achieve our aims of uh, economic integration of the bloc? I mean, 
China and Japan, they have severe political differences, but I mean, their trade surpasses that. Mm. I mean, so with the India and China, they have severe political differences, but their trade is way, way more, right? Do you think that we can hope for a Pakistan that can also be more in economically integrated within the South Asian region, let's for say, because it's a growing um, economy, right? And are we on the right track now, finally? Well, so it seems, but we have had many false signals. But recent this uh, SEO conference, there's some hints that the, it's not getting worse. Maybe it starts improving. Right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Manzoor, for being here, for shedding light on the economics and especially how pa the countries should operate in the international en environment because living in a globalized uh, region or a globalized environment, you cannot uh, be immune from the effects of the global economy. But thank you once again, Dr. Manzoor, thank for thank coming so here, much. for shedding light. We're going on a short break. After we come back, we have a very interesting conversation uh, to be unwind. Don't go anywhere. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome back and in, in a very unfortunate development today marks the 31st anniversary of the tragic Bij Behara massacre that occurred on October 22nd 1993 in Anantnag district of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. On that day, 51 Kashmiris were killed and over 200 were injured as Indian security forces besieged the Dargah Hazrat Bal in Bij Bihara, leading to a violent confrontation with the worshippers gathered for the Friday prayers. The medical and the paramedical staff who came to help the victims were also targeted, and that's a very unfortunate targeting of the unarmed civilians that too in the Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. And um, when we talk about the Kashmir and obviously of the region of the South Asia and the subcontinent particularly, and the flourishing of the arts and flourishing of the culture. So one thing that is very prominent and that comes to mind is um, the flourishing of the calligraphy. And uh, calligraphy is an art, is a very interesting form of the art form um, that has been incorporated in so many modern um, art forms. And um, I was very interested and fascinated to read uh, Pablo Picasso's score. And he said that if I had known there was such a thing as Islamic calligraphy, I would never have started to paint. And we all know the famous Picasso's painting, that tilted sort of a slanted sort of a building that he has painted. It has garnered such a massive attention. And is it a dying art or is it a modern art? And if you talk about the calligraphy, it's a flourishing art. Um, so how it is incorporated in the modern art forms and what are we doing to preserve the beauty of this particular art? Because with the flourishing of the Islamic empire, Islamic civilization, we we saw that calligraphy, Islamic calligraphy in particularly, um, acquired a new height that we never witnessed before. And no matter wherever you go, you know, in any Islamic household and in any Islamic country, oh, yes. there's one thing which is common and that's Islamic calligraphy. That's very true and we will find a lot of ayats and a lot of um, a spiritual art connection with the innermost fo forms um, that is very visible. So in order to introduce our guest, because she is uh, one of the person, um, she is very fluent in the calligraphy and she has produced so many any wonderful, amazing form of the artwork. I'm very glad that we have been joined by Ms. Farah Babar. Assalamu alaikum and thank you so much for coming to our show. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much for joining us. Wonderful to have you over here, or like always. My pleasure. My pleasure as always. So please go ahead and tell us about the calligraphy. Well, calligraphy is an art of expression, right? An expression in the form of design, line, structure, construction, and all. So calligraphy has been an ancient um, uh, art form and dated back to 7th century and all and uh, originated from China, wow. then coming to Greek and Roman calligraphy wow. and all. So you know how the paper was made from the papyrus plant yes. and all and then Chinese writing already Chinese looks like <laughs> <calligraphy> <laughs> to us. So all those us, characters, yeah. of course, we immediately feel that calligraphy is only Islamic. But calligraphy is all around us. Sure. Even in the modern age, Hajra, you were talking about the modern calligraphy. Everything and anything that you see, um, uh, as signboards, neon signs, your computer, everything has calligraphy yes. on yes, it. Yes. Wow. So, uh, you know, the fonts that you use on your computer, 
they are all calligraphy fonts. So right. the different styles of it. And exactly, all. And, and certainly we would love to kind of you know kind of figure it out more for ourselves. But there's right. one question which I always had whenever I actually you know took a good look at Islamic calligraphy at what whoever's place I went to. I was trying to read the surah which was written. You know, it's so hard for you to kind of figure it out. Okay, yeah. what surah it is? You do not want to read it wrong. So don't you think that you know? I mean, it's a personal question. Don't you think that it needs to be in a way where it's at least readable for everybody? Absolutely. You know, in that we have seven different styles so far in the Islamic calligraphy. If you see, starting from the Kufic, okay. you know, and uh, that's where uh, it comes from, Kufa, Baghdad, and. Uh, that style of calligraphy was uh, short straight vertical lines and horizontal strokes right. and without any what we call in Urdu harkat. Right. Harkat are the zair zabar pesh that you put on. Right. So being uh, the uh, you know language of the land uh, probably they didn't need it at the, at the yeah, because beginning. Because previously they didn't have the zair no, zabar no, even didn't. you know when Quran they was written by the Sahaba ji, they ji. never used the zair zabar. Ji, some of some of the I, I happen think you, to. You have a kufa calligraphy with I us. Do, we would request our producer uh, to please uh, show that because you it can is pick a it up as well. You it know, is so a we can replica of the Quran. It is a replica. It's a. It's not full Quran, but right. Hazrat Ali's uh, writing. This is written by Hazrat Imam Ali, so and uh, uh, this is the Kufic style. Oh, sure. And if you see what I was talking about, the horizontal uh, yeah, just keep line. Keep holding it. Yeah, we yeah. come closer. Okay. Yeah. And the straight uh, ver vertical lines and straight strokes. Wow. Wonderful. So later on. You know, these harkats were added for the grammatical and short vowels. Right. For us who are non-Arabic speaking right. and other people to be able to pronounce it right. Because Arabic is such a var uh, vast language that if you mm. pronounce any yeah. word differently, it has mm. a different connotation and oh, meaning oh, to it. Ke ke zabar aaj ta galati ho rahi. <laughs> you know, whenever we <laughs> are, we, we, whenever we are reciting or reading <laughs> Quran, we are like, okay, you know, Kari sahab ne kya badaya tha, <laughs> ke noon ke upar jo zabar lagi hui hai, usko <laughs> silent usko padna hai, <laughs> 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 That's very true, but uh, now, <laughs> Ms. Farah, now let's explore the dot, uh, the connection of the circle and alif within the calligraphy. So, for laymen, uh, for people like us who are not into it, Please explain what is the connection between that, that too in the Islamic calligraphy. The, the uh, harkats you hmm, mean, yes. they are the vowels, the short vowels or the grammatical influence in the language because mm -hmm. to get it correct uh, and to be able to speak it correctly, yeah. Yeah. you need to have these vowels attached to mm -hmm. it. So if you, if there's a zabar, you know that the voice has to go up, I, ga, e, exactly. So that for a non-Arabic uh, person, yes. these harkats are very important for us to know where to stop, where to extend it, where to take it up to bring it down. And, right. and do, do we really mean that, you know, by saying this, that, you know, that the Arabic calligraphy that we see today happens to be one of the oldest forms of uh, Islamic calligraphy? It is. It started in the seventh century. Yeah. Uh, the Arabic calligraphy started in this because you know uh, when Hazrat Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was uh, was the uh, the wahi came, it came in the form of words, yeah. but oral words, True. not in the written form. True. True. And later on, in Hazrat Usman's caliphate, the compilation of Quran on written form in different oh. various ways, or wh whether it was on leather or uh, leaves, I know, leaves yeah. and all. So that was introduced and then it was compiled. You're so well aware, my God, mashallah. It's, it it's is our history, yeah, don't so we <laughs> Which is why now I'm going to bring you to modern calligraphy. Yeah. Now, if we are to, because I don't know, I think that our eyes are so tuned to looking at, you know, the Islamic calligraphy that we yeah. might not have been able to understand whether there was some modern calligraphy around us or not. All so to have a better understanding <laughs> of it, how does that work? You know, what is everything what does modern calligraphy you. looks like? Everything around you. In fact, if you see calligraphy, as I said, dates back to China, ancient China and ancient Greek, okay. right? Mm, so if you see their characters, the mm. Chinese characters, each alphabet or each word has a different character to it. True, true. And their alphabet exceed a hundred, um, uh, um, uh, you know, characters for, so that's why Chinese <laughs> language is very difficult. vast. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. To, to learn and mm. to understand. And the same goes, so uh, coming back to the Islamic calligraphy, we have seven different styles. What your question yep. was earlier that, and also your Shazad, that you know, it's not readable. So th coming to the different styles, starting from the Kufic, mm -hmm. then coming to Diwani. Diwani was the, di from 
arise, uh, derived from Ottoman Empire, okay. which was Divan is like, you know, um, a place uh, a where, place yeah, where yeah. the kings and, you know, the court, nobility court. Yeah, yeah. and the People court. like us sit down. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you and I especially, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, right. they would, and that is where the Khat would be. But, um, actually, calligraphy in Arabic is called Khat. Yeah, and, yeah, and it's labeled Diwani because you know it was read in the Diwan. In the Diwan. Okay. After that comes Tulith. Hmm. Right? Tulith is the third. In Arabic it means third. All right. Right? So it also in order it's also coming in the third. Hmm. And uh, uh, to uh, relate to where how Tulith is re re uh, written, if you see Kaaba Sharif, the Ghilaf e Kaaba, yeah, yeah. the writing on Ghilaf e Kaaba yes. is the Tulith script. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So after Tulith comes Nakshi. Nakshi okay. by Naksh, you know something to be imprinted. Right. Yep. So right. that's all more readable, right? right? right. After Nakshi comes Rayani. Wonderful. After right. Rayani comes uh, Muhakkik. How did you remember that? Uh, well, these <laughs> 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 and then comes Rika. Rika is the last which came mm. in the 19th century. Okay. Okay. All right, and that is more closer to the Tulith uh, form of writing. Which is more popular form? Um, I think the last one um, Tulith is very common in what you see in in a lot of the paintings right. and all. Mostly people go it because of its cursive writing okay. and you know the flowing of it and incorporation and mm. coming into the modern art. What I also try to do is to sort of present it in such a way as you said that it's a dying art and all. Right. So if you uh, make it in a way incorporating other factors in it to make it more appealing to the young generation or right. to the you know people around. So people, yes, everyone has uh, the art form of calligraphy. Yeah, and, and, and how can we differentiate, sorry Aja, but <coughs> you know, so in addition, how can we differentiate, for example, you know, where you spoke about Tulat and you know, all these different types. Now imagine that some calligraphy I've seen are more pointy, more edgy, yeah, more triangle based. Exactly. Some are more curvature based. Exactly. You know, so how do we differentiate, okay, which form and type is this calligraphy? Well, the same as I said, when you start from the Kufik, Kufik you will see there is no Arabs on it. Or okay, uh, so no... Yes, and then the, the lines are, they are very on the straight line, vertical straight line, short lines mm -hmm. and uh, horizontal stroke. So okay. immediately when you see that, it gives, it tells you it is a Kufik. Then coming to um, Diva, sorry, Divani. Divani is also, it's like a print. Okay. Right? right and more readable mm -hmm. it's more readable and that you can see uh, you know the script is very clear and it is written in the form of as if you've done the typing of it and all when you see it on the computer mm -hmm. so things are written very clear Tulit comes when it's more cursive and flowing and uh, you know so those kind of writings then the same so on yeah. and so forth so for uh, Ms. Farah, do you think as a society we patronize art I'm talking about the 21st century um, you know what is the status of that and do you think that and which of the art form is more uh, which you like to like incorporate in your paintings I think I do more to let okay. uh, my my you know the uh, more uh, like circular uh, circular yeah, yeah. cursive yeah, yeah. and integrating with each other and right. of course uh, sometimes Sometimes uh, the surah or the ayat becomes a little difficult to yes. read where to yes. start because you know sometimes you're starting from the base and going upwards yeah. or s yeah. things like that. But I think the eye, my uh, basic thing is that it should not be so complicated okay. that you cannot read at all what, what has been written. Yep. So that yeah. becomes, you know, because the main mm -hmm. idea and the thing is that you should be able to read Exactly. It. And you know, w how I actually came up with this was now imagine that, you know, this, this fine day, Alhamdulillah, I was standing right in front of the Rosa Rasul Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alayhi 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 and you know, those golden doors right in front have got a lot of calligraphy on it. Okay. And then my father said that, you know, that this ayah which is written on mm -hmm. the Rosa Rasul, actually, you know, you should recite it and what and I was trying to read it, I was like, something of that sort, you know, so I was yeah. like, yeah, I, I don't <laughs> know, but I cannot read it properly. Mm -hmm. that, that was a time of such frustration and I was like, yeah, why don't they make why it simpler exactly. for us to kind of read it, right? But you I think it, it brings a lot of history with it. Yes. Uh, I think the beautification part of it also yeah. comes, you know, what flows, what goes together mm -hmm. well yeah. and mm -hmm. all. 
and then the influx of uh, what, what you see in a lot of the palaces and all abroad, you see a lot of figurines and all. Mm. So we don't do that. We have more of our designs which are Asian designs or Persian designs yes. like Paisley's and all incorporated with yeah. our, our script. And then probably to make it more fascinating and interesting and appealing to the and, eye. And not to leave it incomplete, the dua was la 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 malik ul haqqul mubeen, you know, for everybody who wants to recite that, but yeah. very quickly towards the end. I'll tell you one thing, I'm, yeah. I'm working now um, on, on um, a piece of, uh, a, of a client and a friend of mine had given me the ghilaf Kaaba. Mashallah. So I'm doing my calligraphy of names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Ismail Husna, and then uh, sort of putting the ghilaf Kaaba in the middle. Mashallah. So that is one very, very special thing that I'm doing that. right now. And so, you know, so, you know, it is very famously said that the purity of writing is the purity of soul, right? Absolutely. Especially in Islamic calligraphy. But thank you so much, Ms. My Farah, pleasure. for coming here, for having this wonderful conversation regarding the Islamic calligraphy and how it is incorporated in the modern arts. And as a society, I think it's essential on us that we preserve all of these art forms. Um, and sometimes we do see an amalgamation of the modern arts with like the um, ancient arts and how it is incorporated to create something new, a hybrid sort of a thing, but which is equally appealing. Uh, with that, we are going on a short break. After we come back, we have an interesting discussion lined up. Don't go anywhere. Good morning. Good morning. Jabba, welcome back. Thank you so much for staying tuned. Moving ahead, obviously we do have children who are very fascinated about what happens in space, but then we have children who learn about it a lot as well. So we're very lucky that we've actually been joined by the former space ambassador Sparko, Mr. Abdullah Salman. Hello, Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. How are you doing today? Waalaikum salam. Alhamdulillah. I am fine. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure, Abdullah, having you. So what sparked your curiosity into the, I would say, celestial bodies that have always sparked our imagination as a, a human who are living in a very small planet called Earth? So go ahead. Uh, so I have been interested into astronomy when I was in fourth grade. Uh, I remember I was going through my science book and, and there I learned that Jupiter has more than 70 moons. Planet Saturn has more, more than 80 moons. So that's how I started learning about astronomy through articles on Facebook, on verse on uh, Google, and there I uh, watched many documentaries on YouTube, and my interest began to grow and grow. Uh, then came a point when I was 12 years old, I thought of making my own telescope because I had read, in, read enough. Now I thought okay, I should look at the stars, I should look beyond what on our Earth, and that's how my journey began and is still going. Wow. You know, so, so, so while we are at it, can you please share your incident of becoming the ambassador for uh, for Supako? Yeah. You know, because you were a former ambassador. Was it because of the telescope you made? How successful was your telescope? And do you still look at stars only or you spy on your neighbors too? Or what do you aspire to be <laughs> when you grow up? <laughs> okay, so too many questions to be very honest. <laughs> so, um, my, I, I, after making a telescope, I thought, okay, why not I show my neighbors, my friends, my classmates what is... Uh, about astronomy and how how does the how does our universe work? So I made Faisalabad Astronomical Society in my uh, city, and after that I took many sessions in different public schools, uh, in public parks, and that's how Sparko recognized my efforts and made me the space ambassador for World One. And since 2021, we are doing uh, regular sessions in various schools, public parks, orphanages, madrasas, where we show the children, the public, what really the moon is, what are the gas joints, what are the planets. So this is how I became the space ambassador of uh, Sparko. After making a telescope, I took part in different uh, competitions held by NASA and Sparko, and I became the national winner in those. And then uh, my journey, and then I took part in 
international asteroid search campaign and discovered an asteroid for our country, Pakistan, and that is the only discovery me and my team made. And I aspire to become a future, inshallah, astrophysicist and uh, want to join NASA one day, inshallah. Best of luck. But can I, can I over here for a moment put your knowledge to a test? If you don't mind, it's an easy question. Or can sure, you sure. I love, I, I love satellites or geo satellites. What's the difference in between these two satellites? Uh, geo satellites and Leo. Actually, the geo satellites are a satellites which are synchronized with the rotation of our Earth, so they do not move and they regularly track the position of anybody on the planet, and that's that's why they are called geo satellites. Whereas the geo satellites, I think they do not, they are not synchronized with the rotation of our Earth. And they regularly uh, orbit in our uh, in the, around our Earth and have their own uh, orbit. One last question: So you've done pretty well. Do you, do you think life can exist on planet Mars? Inshallah, <laughs> in future Inshallah, it, it will like exist it, yeah. after making a suitable habitat for our us for our humans. That's wow. very true, and I think there's so much uh, in the celestial bodies to explore, and it was always fascinated the human mind uh, because uh, again, celestial bodies reminds us that we are nothing, right? Because there's so much out there, so expensive world out there, and we are just living in a very uh, myopic sort of a world. Um, thank you so much, Abdullah, for coming here, for having this wonderful cross pollination of ideas regarding the astronomy, telescope, space, celestial bodies, and flourishing of the space uh, exactly. So with that, we um, will wrap up this segment. We will say. Allah Hafiz. Until next time, it's a goodbye and good morning. Good morning. Have a great day.